So uh, welcome to uh, this panel discussion. Uh, my name is Brian Hudson. I'm uh, chairing this session and also contributing. I'm currently a uh, guest professor in the Department of Educational Studies and uh, working with the Rose Group at Karlstadt University, research on the subject specific education. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Nicholas Gerricke, who's a professor in science education and director of the Science, Maths and Engineering Education Research Centre and also co-director of the um, research group, uh, research group, Rose Research Group at um, Karlstadt. Um, I'm also joined by Christina Olin Scheller. She's professional educational work and director of the Centre for Language and Literature in Education at Karlstadt, and also director of the Rose Research Group. And also by Martin Stellara, who's professor in history, co-director of the research group, and the Rose Research Group, and a senior researcher in the Centre for Social Science Education. What we plan to do, um, I think my, the view has changed slightly here. Uh, what, what we plan to do is um, I'll give a short uh, welcome and overview and some background to the panel discussion. Um, and then Nicholas is going to talk on uh, the topic of trajectories of epistemic quality and powerful knowledge across school subjects. And he will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. Our, um, our aim, if I can get this to stand, no. it's not quite doing what I want with this <laughs> presentation. Um, uh, Martin will talk on the topic of teachers' powerful professional knowledge as subject specific educational content knowledge, and then I'll say something about ideas um, that I've developed over the last few years around the idea of didactical design for technology enhanced learning, and then pass the baton to Christina, who will talk on a case study of transformation and literacy engagement through digitalized teaching practice in, so in social studies. And then our plan is to leave about 25 to 30 minutes for questions at the end. So, just to give some background context, um, as, you, as you'll see in the abstract, um, the, um, the work that's, that we're presenting here has arisen from the context of the COST network, which is funded by the Swedish Research Council. It's an international research network, um, three main partners, Karlstadt University, hosted by the Rose Group, together with uh, the Humanities and Social Sciences Research Education Research Group in Helsinki, and also the Subject Specific Research Group at the Institute of Education at UCL in London. Um, so the focus is on knowledge and quality across school subjects and teacher education. And um, just to give a brief overview, um, the main research idea is to study how content knowledge uh, in different school subjects is defined and transformed uh, by taking a comparative perspective across education systems um, and also using uh, the theoretical concepts of powerful knowledge, epistemic quality and transformation. And uh, we've got links in the abstract to recent papers um, which sort of frame the, um, the whole thinking around the project. Um, and our research questions are centered around, um, firstly, the nature of powerful knowledge and epistemic quality. How can they be characterized across different school subjects? Um, how can the transformation processes related to these aspects be described? And how can the nature, how can the nature of teachers' powerful professional knowledge be characterized? What are the implications for teacher education policy and practice? Um, we are drawing on um, two books that are currently in work in progress. Um, the first one has an emphasis on knowledge and quality um, across school subjects. 
and this addresses the first two research questions. And the second book um, takes from that experience into um, a context of thinking about teacher education policy and practice. Um, and the focus of this book is on knowledge and quality and addresses the third research question, along with um, the question raised by Furlong and Whitty in 2017, who asked how can disciplinary knowledge and other external knowledges be brought together with professionals reflective practice and practical theorizing in professional arenas to produce really powerful professional knowledge and learning. So that's what we're hoping to address. Okay, so the floor is yours, Nicholas. Thank you very much. So uh, nice to see you all. I will try now to share my slides, see if I succeed with this. I hope so. Uh, where did it go? Ah, here it is. So hopefully you can see a slide here with, uh, with the title of um, my talk, which is kind of continuation then of, uh, of Brian's uh, <coughs> ingress here of, of our kind of uh, program or research project. So uh, it's called Trajectories of Epistemic Quality and Powerful Knowledge Across School Subjects. And um, as Brian said in the introduction here, I mean, uh, I'm a, a researcher in, uh, in science education and more specifically in biology education. So uh, I am in the field of subject didactics, as we often uh, say here in, in, in the European tradition. And all of the colleagues that is part of that, uh, Nina and Martin also is in other fields, in language education, in social science studies. So all of this project is situated in, in, the, in the disciplines and the subjects of different uh, schools, uh, school subjects. So that was our starting point. And uh, so when we started to collaborate uh, some years ago, before we started the cost network and uh, we got engaged with Brian, we kind of tried to communicate because we're all subject didactic people, but we are in different domains, different uh, subject areas. So uh, we have tried then to develop a conceptual framework for research and education in subject specific education so that we can kind of uh, use in our different fields in mathematics or in language or in civics or geography uh, didactics. Uh, so um, in that way, we think that uh, there is an important gap to fill. And uh, uh, in this work, we have, as already Brian said, we have kind of, uh, worked with some kind of key concepts that we could relate to in these different areas of subject specific education that we thought would be productive for us. So these have been uh, powerful knowledge that was coined by Michael Young already 2009. And it's about the knowledge dimension that we think is of course very evident and important in all school subjects or for that matter in the disciplines of the academic sciences uh, as well. And the other one was that a transformation, that there is a difference between the school subjects and the discipline and how to address this difference and the relations between the different levels. That's also one of the key issues. And the third is what we had uh, termed epistemic quality, which Brian started to explore within the field of mathematics education. And it's about that uh, this knowledge is then uh, enacted in the classroom and uh, this enactment process can also uh, be compared and be different in diff or similar in the different school subjects. So these three uh, uh, concepts is what we're trying to work with and also try to find commonalities and relationships in between. So if we start with a powerful knowledge, I don't know, in this audience, it might be uh, very familiar to you or it might not. So here is just some kind of what, what, the, what are we talking about? Well, 
there is knowledge that is specialized both in how it's uh, produced, and that is often occurring, of course, in the academic level, in the disciplines, in the research frontier, uh, but also how it's transmitted or uh, how it's uh, reshaped in, 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 the, in, in other levels in the educational system. And this knowledge is different or differentiated from uh, the knowledge that the students bring in to the classroom or school uh, in university or in school that we are especially, of course, interested in as science uh, didactics at the school level. So, and the, the idea from Young here was that uh, in, in recent years, there has been in educational research or educational policy a drift away from, uh, from the knowledge dimension more to kind of competence-based, uh, generic uh, skills-based uh, curriculum and ideas. And we as subject didactics uh, think that the, this dimension is therefore important to, to, to use and explore in, in our endeavor in both research and in uh, education, of course. The transformation or transformation processes uh, is uh, what we call an integrated process through which specialized knowledge developed in different subject disciplines is reshaped or represented in in the educational system at different levels, like in the policy document of the educational system, but also in the, in the, uh, in the teacher eyes and also what is learned by the students. And uh, these processes occur then uh, at, at these different levels, in the individual level, but also at, uh, far up in the system at the institutional level when policy documents, for example, are produced, but also at the societal level, because knowledge in school doesn't only come from the academic, it also comes from other sources. And this is then taught and learned. And our idea here is we've used the term transformation, but we are aware, of course, that this part is important in many different theories, like in, uh, in uh, didactic transposition or in the recontextualization as a turn by Bernstein in curriculum theory or by educational reconstruction and so on. So there are these aspects of education is important. So, and this is kind of a, a concept to bring that together. And the epistemic quality that we talk about the nature quality of the teaching and learning in the didactical interaction between the student and the teacher. And uh, this is of course, when the knowledge is enacted and this is uh, an idea uh, first developed by, uh, uh, by Brian here, and it's, uh, it's has taken its departure from the joint action theory and the didactic contract and the didactic situation in the classroom. So uh, Brian already said that we have worked in the last years with these two research questions connecting these concepts. How can the nature of powerful knowledge and epistemic quality in different school subjects be characterized? And how can the transformation process related to powerful knowledge and epistemic quality be described? And our interest is especially to investigate these concepts in empirical studies, in settings. And uh, we ask that to our colleagues in these three groups that Brian talked about and also other researchers throughout uh, Europe and, and other continents. And the, one of the books Brian referred to is this that focus on school subjects. And in this book, we have uh, some chapters, all these chapters addressing these two research questions and these three concepts in different ways. So uh, this was what we would like to explore. Uh, can we find something commonality and build these concepts uh, based on these empirical studies? If we look at them jointly, we can see that these 10 studies were conducted in different school subjects in language education. In the, I think we have four studies in that area in social science studies, in science, in chemistry education. We have a couple of chapters in mathematics education, in physical education, and also a contribution to which I also uh, contributed to in sustainability education, where we look at teachers from different areas in social science and science and language and how they interact with the content and, and uh, how they enact it. And these studies comes from many different countries, Finland, England, France, Germany, Scotland, Sweden, and addresses studies from both primary and secondary education in the different school subjects. 
So this was a short overview. And then in the last chapter, we have tried to discern what can we see from these empirical studies? Because our experience is that most what is written about this concept is often kind of from a theoretical perspective. So what happens when educational researchers address these questions at an empirical level? And here is some kind of summaries of our, uh, of our analysis of these three, 10 chapters. So if we look into uh, the, the, the idea or the concept of powerful knowledge, we can see that in these studies, it kind of uh, uh, is addressed within the process of transformation because powerful knowledge becomes visible and discernible first after the transformation in the classroom. And more specifically in the relation to what this content can bring about for the students in relation to the life world not only to, uh, of course, to what the academic discipline defines as the most uh, powerful knowledge. That was anyway how it turned out in the studies. And by possessing this powerful knowledge, the students uh, in many of the, the studies can transform their experience into an interaction with the social world in which they are living, which they would not have been able to do without uh, uh, possessing this particular knowledge. So. What we can see here that many of the contributions focus on the power aspects of the concept of powerful knowledge. That is what the knowledge can do for the students rather on the structures of the knowledge dimension itself. Um, and uh, much of this might also depend on which of the contributing studies that were part of this, so which we will see when we also explore the ideas or concepts of epistemic quality quality and transformation. But we could see that the knowledge how, that is more skill-based knowledge, knowledge that is addressed in abilities such as reasoning, problem solving, and role play, that, that this was very much emphasized in many of the studies, but even more so in some of the uh, different uh, school subjects like language education and physical education. So here we can discern a difference between school subjects. And knowing that the propositional knowledge is more emphasized or more visible in the studies related to the uh, school subjects of mathematics, science, and also social science here. So we can see that uh, there is some commonalities, but also some differences. And the commonalities is mostly explored in the concept of transformation which is fundamentally described similar across all these school subjects, even though the constituting parts, the knowledge that is transformed is described differently, like the knowing that or knowing how. And depending on how this transformation process occur, we could find that the, the, the different chapters were describing processes taking different trajectories that kind of uh, ended up in in uh, successful teaching or in less successful teaching of that is of uh, teaching of, of high epistemic quality or low epistemic quality so the path of this specific trajectory could be manifested in in uh, in epistemic quality okay. and uh, professor garrick you have about uh, two minutes uh, around just so that you know for the time perfect i have just two more slides <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and trying to kind of summarize this is very difficult because these uh, studies of course occurred uh, in different contexts and have different uh, approaches. But if we start in a curriculum tradition, we can talk about the intended curriculum, enacted curriculum and learned curriculum. And of course this transformation process is trying to over, to connect these different levels of the, uh, of the curriculum. And what we could see then that in the intended curriculum, of course, you, uh, you, there is an academic discipline that is, uh, that is uh, knowledge uh, parts that is expected to be enacted in the classroom, the knowing that, the knowing how. And of course, as we saw, there were different aspects uh, emphasized in these different studies in the language education, more of the knowing that how, and in the other, more of the knowing that, but also knowing how that was present. But then, of course, that this needs to be uh, connected to the life world of the student, the everyday knowledge and the knowledge bringing in from the student from other domains than school. 
so the powerful knowledge would be then, according to the theory, in, in that in the academic discipline. And then it is enacted in the in the classroom, in the learning game, as we when we address the joint action theory. But what we mostly would like to emphasize here is that within the learning game, there is also kind of an epistemic game that addresses the different characteristics of the school subjects from the various uh, school disciplines stemming from the academic level. And if everything goes in a, in a, in a way that connect the epistemic game with the learning game in this, in a way that uh, connects the life world of the student and the, and the knowledge that is supposed to be transformed from the academic discipline, we could have knowledge of the powerful the student that can use that knowledge in different situations. So this is what we would have described. So we have different trajectories here, but it is about then to connect the academic discipline with the knowledge that the students bring in themselves and also other stakeholders in the school. And it is important then it's not only about the learning, but also that the epistemic game needs to draw on this specific, is a difficult word, specificity of the, of the knowledge dimension of each uh, academic discipline as well when it is enacted. So this was our kind of main findings of this study in a very short and very crude. So I know it's hard to do this in 15 minutes, but uh, thank you. And hopefully this will be more elaborated in the next talk by Martin, I think. Thank, thank you, you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, that was um, uh, an excellent start. And um, I now am pleased to welcome Martin, who will um, speak on a theme that's more um associated with the the second book that we referred to um on the implications for teacher education so the floor is yours martin thank you unmute martin <laughs> so it's better this way uh so the, the the headline for this is teachers powerful professional knowledge as subject specific educational content knowledge uh, as you, I think you understood that we have been greatly inspired by the discussion introduced by Michael Jung and Johan Müller for more than 10 years when they introduced, in a way, the concept of powerful knowledge as a curriculum principle. And we have asked ourselves uh, what the notion of powerful knowledge um, could mean in practice. You understand we have made this... Uh, this focus into different subjects and in, in teacher practice. And, and then we come to more to realize that we need to address how this is uh, played out in, in the teacher practice and teacher education. What is it, what kind of knowledge do teachers need to be in order to be successful in their work? It's a knowledge that can be understood as powerful from the perspective of the teacher profession. So th these kind of perspective had led us to, uh, to connect to Fala and Witte on their book from, um, it's four years old now, from 2017, where they ask a question that we find kind of intriguing. They say, how can disciplinary knowledge and other external knowledges be brought together with professionals' reflective practices and practical theorizing in professional arenas to produce really powerful professional knowledge and learning. So in the second book that uh, Brian mentioned, in the book, I think I have a slide here on that, uh, uh, on the book, International Perspectives on Knowledge and Quality, uh, uh, the researchers of the cost network uh, were focusing on the, on the research question how can the nature of teachers' powerful professional knowledge be characterized? And what are the implications for teacher education's policy and practice? I now intend to discuss these questions based on, in a similar way like Nicholas, based on, on the studies presented in the various chapters of this book. But we as editors, we had the role and the possibility to frame the book. And we did that. We tried to do that. And we framed it in, in two ways framed it in two ways in a way. Uh, among one thing, one thing we, we did, we, we, we stressed 
uh, the trends today have an impact how, on how the teacher uh, education in different countries is, is structured. In countries like the US, in England, in Canada, in Australia, is teacher education relocated from universities, which could be perceived as an expression of a de -academization. The role of a teacher education institution is downplayed. In other countries like Finland, Norway, Scotland, Scotland and perhaps Sweden, we can see another trend. We can see a trend during the 10 or 20, during 10 or 20 last years going towards more academization of uh, teacher education, introducing master level and so forth. Another way we framed this book was to focus on the relationship between the Anglo-Saxon curriculum perspective and the didactic tradition. We believe that there are questions put in the curriculum research setting that might find its answers within the didactic tradition. So this is a bit about the framing of, of the book in the first and the last chapter. So now to the, the, the questions. How can powerful professional knowledge be characterized? How is this concept discussed within the book? Um, to find a balance between practice and theory is a central to teacher education. And that is something that is stressed in more than one of the chapters of the book. In chapter four of the book, Standish Mitchell describes their goal with geography teacher education to enable the student teachers to develop thoroughness. The teachers, the teacher has to develop good judgment with respect to planning, teaching, assessing learning, and the need to embody a model of uh, and model the academic values inherent to the profession. Hence, we believe, they say, Standish Mitchell, in the practical competence and wisdom of teachers being connected to a theoretical body of knowledge about education and, to specify, geographic, geography education specifically, the secondary geography ITE curriculum. Pustinen, uh, in chapter three, focus on the in, also on the interplay between theory and practice, and says that is a central aspect of building a strong uh, teacher education, but it's a difficult uh, relationship. Iversen and Kudbranson, Kudbranson in uh, who is focused on the situation in Norway, uh, recognize an opportunity in organizing teacher education so it supports the development of powerful professional knowledge among student teachers. Their starting point is that theorem practice needs to be combined in dedication and they say creating structural condition is crucial if the student teachers are to develop powerful professional knowledge. So when the concept of powerful professional knowledge is described in the book, the aspect of theorem practice is central. If you go back to uh, uh, Standish and Mitchell, uh, they specify a little bit more what, what they mean by powerful professional knowledge. They say a strong notion of subject discipline and education as potentially transformative and how this can be applied in practical planning, teaching, assessment and evaluation is a way that powerful professional knowledge can be characterized. This perspective can be linked to Stone et al. in uh, chapter five, who emphasizes teachers' meta understanding as essential. And they say the nature of the RE teacher's powerful professional knowledge includes awareness uh, of the nature of, of knowledge and the ability to see the significance of the knower. The teacher and the teacher educator should be wary of this and commit to teacher education that encompasses a process of developing epistemic literacy as a powerful profession knowledge that continues through one's career. Another example on how to define and um, characterize power, powerful uh, profession knowledge is done by Hudson in chapter eight. Uh, uh, here, powerful profession knowledge is framed as something that 
the teacher is uh, does to establish a practice for teaching and learning a, sp a specific content. And he points towards four dimension of the teacher's uh, practice. And these four dimensions are related to the didactic triangle and the PCK approach. So by characterizing uh, powerful professional knowledge in terms of these uh, four dimensions, Hudson gives the concept a more specific substance, substance and puts it in, that, in more in contact with the educational practice. Uh, as I said before, we, we are very interested in the relationship between the curriculum and the didactic tradition, so the different perspectives. And as a result of the analysis of the different chapters in relation between the didactic and curriculum tradition, uh, we uh, have seen an idea and then have an idea how to do, elaborate on the PCK approach. Uh, uh, in to some extent, because the PCK approach has come to dominate the international research discourse around teachers' knowledge base. We see challenge in this approach, and our position is uh, supported by the studies uh, in the different chapters of this book. To our understanding, it might be a mistake to distinguish, separate uh, the what question from the how question. Because such a separation, even though adjustment had may have been made to the PCK approach, still permeates it. It's a focus on the how question, if you say so. We want to point out that, that the didactic how question is, a, uh, is an integrated part of the teacher's relationship to the discipline and the school subject. We, we therefore want to introduce the concept of subject specific educational content knowledge, a long word, but long concept. And we, we think we find support for this in the book by the different chapters, because McLean and Davis uh, make clear in chapter six how essential it is that powerful knowledge in teacher education is framed in, in relation to the educational practice. This suggests that teachers' content knowledge should have a particular quality, something touched upon in more than one chapter of the book. It's a recurring theme of the book. In, for example, chapter 11, Prussian, explicitly focus on secondary teachers' content knowledge in math education, making the PCK approach third point of reference. Uh, Prussian show how necessary it is that math teachers have a knowledge in math that differs from other professional groups for which knowledge and math, math also a part of, the, of their knowledge base. The term used for this content knowledge special to teachers is specialized content knowledge. Christian argues convincingly that teachers ought to have an in-depth disciplinary content knowledge since that kind of high quality knowledge can lead to a much needed reflective relations relation to the specialized subject knowledge of the school subject. The concept of specialized uh, content knowledge that Christian refers to um, uh, is obviously connected to the PCK approach. Of uh, particular interest of this book where relationship, as I said, between curriculum didactics and an underlying theme is that specialized content knowledge might be a step towards uh, what we could say, a didactization of PCK. As specialized content knowledge is defined, it's about content knowledge. However, it is an idea of content knowledge defined in relation to the teacher's educational and didactical mission. It is subject specific educational content knowledge. If one is allowed to let the didactic terminology characterize the concept. What it means is that teachers' content knowledge have a distinctive integrated didactic character. This subject specific education and content knowledge might be expressed as an insight into the basic knowledge structure of the discipline and of the school subject, and the reflective experience of what it really means to acquire this specific knowledge. And this experience could be a starting point for the teacher and a guide uh, for the teacher and guiding the process of planning and executing the teaching. So we, uh, 
Professor Strollard, we have around three minutes left. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> uh, so we want to connect and say it's important to have, from a didactic perspective, to have this obvious connection be between the why, the what, and the how. And then we introduce and, and, and see this uh, concept of specific educational content knowledge as it's a way to discuss this. Uh, finally, um, what about the implication for teacher, uh, teacher education? There are some strong arguments for making subject didactic the central field of knowledge within teacher education. The subject uh, didactic perspective, where teaching is seen in a contextual interaction between content teacher and student, should also permit student teachers disciplinary studies, we say, because it could enable them to develop a strong subject specific educational content knowledge. However, for it to be possible for teachers to develop, develop that type of knowledge, where practice and theory are interwoven, it is necessary that the academy still plays a vital role in teacher education. The trend towards decoupling teacher education for universities, teacher education institution, which is, as I said, a trend in England, in Australia, and in the US, is cause for concern. It is hard to see how such a development could contribute to the development of, knowledge, of a knowledge base that is based on what can be characterized as powerful professional knowledge. Thank you. And Brian, I give the floor to you and I stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so um, I'll, I'll now move into um, my presentation, which is um, the third part. I'll just share my screen. Wrong one. Okay, I've got that. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a few words about the idea of didactical design for technology enhanced learning. Um, and um, it's broadly based on a book chapter that I wrote um, some time ago, which is referenced in our um, abstract for this session. Um, so I'm going to take um, two points of departure. Uh, the first one being the idea of teachers as designers and curriculum makers. Um, second point is in the ideas of uh, Klafke and his five questions related to didactic analysis. I'll then talk about the didactical design cycle and what that means for thinking about the use of technology. And I'll finish with a, an exemplar. I'll just point towards the exemplar of supporting the development of teachers powerful professional knowledge. So the, um, the first point of departure relates to the process of curriculum design, and in particular study by the late Michael Huberman, which really inspired my thinking. And curriculum design is seen as the kind of problem solving which assumes that the process of learning, experimentation and change will be moderately complex, novel, ambiguous, contradictory and conflicting, with particular attention given to the instructional design process. Um, and to quote directly, uh, these are in effect the ideal conditions for significant learning, be it for adults or for children. Oftentimes too, they can trigger self-doubts in more than one sector at once, in one sense of content, 
mastery in one's implicit theory of learning, in one's comfort with instructional management. And the, the thing that um, I want to emphasize here is that this is very much from the perspective of the teacher as the curriculum maker and the, the, the designer of the curriculum. Uh, second point of departure is um, the um, work of Wolfgang Klafke and um, his work in the tradition of critical constructive didactic, didactic, which has also inspired my thinking over the last 10 years or so. Um, and his five questions, are, which are about didactic analysis, um, are based on the idea that the value of any content can only be determined with reference to an individual learner with a particular human historical situation in mind and together with its associated past and anticipated future. And as such, these questions reflect the view that preparation for teaching is not a technical issue, uh, but rather it's an interpretive issue, um, an issue to be considered in the light of a pedagogical situation. Um, and a major contribution is, is the way in which uh, Klafke's work has placed emphasis on prior didactic analysis through these five questions. So firstly, the question is re relating to the wider or general sense of reality that the contents exemplify and open up for the learner. What, what basic phenomenon or fundamental principle what law, criterion, problem, method, technique, or attitude can be grasped by dealing with this content as an example? And what significance does the content in question um, or the experience, knowledge, ability, or skill to be acquired through this topic already possess in the minds of the learners? What significance should it have from a pedagogical point of view? And what constitutes the topic's significance for the learner's future? Uh, the fourth question goes on to raise a question about the structure of the content um, and its place in relation to a particular pedagogical perspective um, raised by the first three questions. And finally, the fifth question addresses the question of what special cases, phenomena, situations, experiments, persons, elements of an aesthetic experience and so on in terms of which the structure of the content in question can become interesting, stimulating, approachable, conceivable or vivid for learners. Now, I'd like to, in this next slide, just distinguish between the um, five questions. Um, in my view, the emphasis on the pro process of didactic analysis um, plays down the role of design. And my argument is that um, the first three questions are undoubtedly about the process of didactic analysis, whereas questions four and five are more concerned um, with a process of creative design that is at the, at the core of teacher's work and which I refer to as didactical design. So here we have the first three questions that have been about the analysis phase and the next or the, the, the last two being about the design phase. And just to say a little bit more about this aspect of um, didactical design, I, I see it as being through the combination of planning and invention or creative design that the professional judgment of the teacher is brought into focus through this process. And uh, if A, if not the central role for the teacher at the core of teaching, studying and learning processes, I see as involving the design of teaching situations, pedagogical activities and learning environments. And in line with, but expanding on what is uh, a very narrowly conceived behavioristic uh, instructional design model, common, commonly referred to as the ADI model, this role can be seen as involving a cyclical process of didactical analysis, didactical design, followed by development, interaction and evaluation, leading through to a subsequent process of redesign. So here we have it presented um, as a figure with um, analysis based on Klafke's questions one to three, 
um, and design on questions four and five. And I think my um, Scandinavian colleagues might describe this as a process of the didactization of the ADI model, um, which is a, a term that I've become more familiar with over recent uh, years and months. Um, and um, the development really being about the development as curriculum making by teachers. So that the curriculum making here is seen as the activity of the pedagogical work of teachers, not necessarily curriculum designers at a distance who are then um, presenting what is most likely to be um, a broadcast instructional model involving scripted curriculum and scripted lessons, which um, I would associate it with models of what some policymakers refer to as remote education. So um, this next slide brings us to the point where we introduce um, technology into the picture. And what it attempts to do is illustrate the way in which the introduction of technology um, is uh, adding a dimension. So the, the, what we've got here is um, representation of a, a three-dimensional model. So rather than thinking in terms of the more familiar didactical triangle with, in two dimensions, here we've got the technology which is introducing a third dimension. So here we've actually got um, a representation of a tetrahedron, so a three, 3D figure. And the questions that are raised um, are now extended from what content, why and how, if we're just considering uh, the right hand uh, vert uh, vertices of the um, tetrahedron. It, the, the questions that are now raised when we think about technologies are what technologies, why and how, and the what, why and how of the creation of digital teaching situations, pedagogical activities, and open and flexible learning environments that, is, uh, that are to be created, and the questions of why and the question of how. And the um, associated questions that are raised for the development phase um, become questions about the potential role of technology in terms of designing um, and the materials and resources that need to be developed to support the creation of these teaching situations, pedagogical activities and learning environments. In many ways, these questions are the questions that would uh, be asked of um, a more conventional uh, classroom context. And what, what is the role of the teacher in this, this new um, digitalized world? Um, in terms of the interaction phase, how will the students interact with the technology, with the teacher and with each other? How will the students develop, demonstrate their achievement in this digitalized, open and flexible learning environment? Um, finally, um, in terms of uh, an exemplar, I just want to talk briefly about um, the Developing Mathematical Thinking project, which I've written about and is referenced in the abstract. I've written about it with colleagues in 2015, the Journal of Curriculum Studies. And um, this was a project in which we worked with uh, teachers uh, through a technology enhanced blended learning approach, uh, 24 practicing primary teachers in Northeast Scotland. And um, the chapter that Martin's already referred to um, is uh, a new sort of fresh look at um, the way in which the teachers um, were curriculum makers in terms of thinking about school mathematics of higher epistemic quality. And that's the chapter that Martin referred to. So what I'll do is now I'll pass over to, I'll leave it at this point. Um, there are uh, references and um, these will be available um, in the slides after the conference if people are interested in, in looking at further detail. And I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'm very pleased now to be able to hand over to my colleague, uh, Christina, who will exemplify digitalized teaching practices further through her case study involving a focus on transformation and literacy engagement 
through digitalized teaching practices and so social studies. So the floor is yours, uh, Christina. Thank you, Brian. I sh should unmute, start with unmuting myself. Uh, and um, finally, uh, from this presentation, uh, for, for this afternoon's presentation, uh, we are in the classroom because this is an example or uh, this presentation takes its points of departure in the classroom and in the uh, empirical data that um, uh, some of that are shown uh, within one of these books uh, that Martin and uh, Niklas talked about in the beginning. And as uh, uh, Brian said, that the title of, of the chapter is Transformation and Literacy Engagement through Digitalized Teaching Practices and Social Studies. So the, uh, the, 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 the uh, school subject is social studies here. Uh, and as you can see on this first slide, I should just start the slideshow, sorry. Um, uh, I have some colleagues uh, with me in this chapter, uh, Marie Nilsbert and Martin Kristiansson, um, and uh, I, I will be the presenting author, but we are three of us in the text. And um, in, in this study, uh, our points of departure is that focusing transformation of con we are focusing transformation of content in a specific classroom where the teacher as well as the students are using digital resources and from Sweden as a as an example uh, um, upper secondary and also lower secondary is highly digitalized today at upper secondary uh, almost every student has uh, been provided a laptop from school. So uh, all, all classrooms in Sweden at upper secondary are digitalized. Uh, and there is also high pressure on teachers and students to use, to use the digital resources. And of course, these, this, the, the uh, uh, challenge is a lot of teaching practices that has been established earlier. Uh, and not, not the least, the, the transformation of content in a digitalized classroom. Uh, and here in this specific study, we use uh, the um, uh, uh, literacy engagement model as a framework because we, we um, uh, have as a point of departure that student and teachers engagement with texts in the classroom are understood as literacy practices based on questions on how and why and who with whom people communicate and interact through different different kinds of texts. So even though it's the example is social studies, we have this literacy uh, framework for understanding and analyzing uh, what is happening. And as you can see, we have Barton and Jean Street uh, as uh, our theoretical um, standpoint. And in this specific classroom at this specific time, uh, the, uh, the, the content was organized around uh, um, a section with law and order. And here, uh, our aim is to deepen knowledge on what and how content is represented in this digitalized classroom and discuss how transformation processes can enable knowledge with high epistemic quality, because that is something that we have tried to uh, um, explore in a lot of, of articles before this one as well. Um, and the, 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 the uh, theoretical framework, as I mentioned, is uh, the literacy engagement framework, which Cummins uh, has um, presented earlier together with colleagues. And just to mention some of, of uh, the bullet points in this framework, uh, we will like here to, to present four of them. And um, uh, one bullet point for, for the, this uh, literacy, for, for, for creating a literacy engagement is that a student has to, uh, the, the student's background knowledge has to be activated by uh, the, um, the teaching. For example, what are the opportunities for the students to connect the, to the teaching to previous understandings? So this is, a, uh, this is something that has to be done in order to be successful with teaching. Uh, and also uh, you have to provide explicit uh, instruction and um, relating to the content that is. And how one question then is how does the teacher represent the subject specific content? 
in this specific um, example. The teacher also has to be scaffolding meaning, uh, for example, uh, how students understanding and use of academic language in relation to subject specific content, how can that be described? And lastly, uh, there, the assignments has to be challenging uh, and uh, challenging intellectually. They have to um, um, be about things that students don't really know everything about. So one question for us here is how does the teaching challenge the students thinking in terms of the subject specific content? So this is, uh, this is the, um, uh, the framework that we use to understand what is happening in this classroom. And I just want to say something about the data uh, because we have uh, numerous hours of, of uh, uh, filmed material and this material is um, collected in, in, in the, within the classroom and within the teaching situation. We have three um, cameras in the classroom and uh, we have one or two focus students in each classroom and we have two or, or three microphones depending on how many uh, focus students there are. So one microphone on the teacher and one uh, microphone on the focus, focus student. Uh, and these three films are combined into one film. So we will have the full uh, lesson, what is happening on the lesson on one film, finally, where we do the analysis, uh, where we can see what the teacher is doing. We can see what, this, what the focus student is doing. Uh, together with, with friends or together with classmates. And we can also watch the screen uh, of the focus student and see what is happening uh, there. So therefore we will have a very in-depth uh, uh, possibility to, to see uh, how the, the, the teachers, uh, um, how, how he, in this case, how, how the teacher is representing the content and to, uh, how the teaching is um, transformed to, to, uh, to the students and to their understanding. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a case from this law and order lesson, which we have made uh, analysis from. Um, when we do the analysis, we, we take out parts and, and do quite close uh, uh, analysis with with um, uh, conversation analysis framework to understand how the meaning making processes are uh, how how they can be described and how they how they develop and I can't in this situation here uh, or in this context here I, I give you all the details about that so I, I just go to the to the results uh, directly. And in relation to this literacy engagement framework, we could, uh, we could see that the lecture is organized around a presse presentation, which includes multimodal text to support students' understanding. So that is something that, that uh, a quite um, a varied uh, variation of texts are offered to the students in this uh, situation here. Uh, the presse. Uh, creates a predetermined trajectory where the students primarily copy text. And this is basically because the Prezi presentation offers uh, um, the teachers to have a very high speed. Uh, you, can, you can easily change from one picture to another and the, the, the speed of, of, of the presentation by the teacher is very, uh, is very quick. Uh, and the teacher also has this predetermined trajectory. Uh, the teacher knows what, what will be next, and it's very difficult to, to uh, change these, uh, this predetermined uh, trajectory for the teacher. Um, and the assignments uh, within this present, um, Prezi, they have very low intellectual challenge because the teachers, are, the, the students are only uh, offered to copy actually. Um, and 
the challenge is low uh, in relation to students' experiences, questions, and understanding. Um, and they are not part of the lesson either because of this predetermined trajectory. So student questions are seen as something that disturbs this predetermined trajectory. Um, and the teacher uses subject specific concepts and terms uh, in relation to the subject area that the, the, the content is very, uh, um, you, you could say it is this of high um, epistemic quality in, in the way that it's chosen. Uh, uh, it, it's chosen in a way that 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 in that way that students are able to understand what is um, what what the content is meaning. But the concept in this teaching situation is not related to each other, uh, and they are not related the, to the pre students' previous understanding either, which make makes them very. Um, uh, it, it makes a lot of confusion and uh, uh, the, the copying process that they are set to do um, um, hinders them to, to create some meaning um, at the time being during the lesson. And um, finally, uh, there are possi possible openings to deepen content in relation to students' background knowledge, but they are not followed up because the questions that the students have, they, as I said before, they disturb this pre predetermined trajectory uh, and they, they, they turn another way, they, they, they sort of open another door, uh, which the teacher doesn't want to open because um, the trajectory is already predetermined. So, so you, um, the, this leaves the teacher with a with the possibility to follow up, but uh, the, the technology uh, disturbs that. And uh, let's see here. Why can't I go further? So just a quick reminder: around three minutes. Yes, I. Just want to start here um, to summarize. Um, and if you if you take a look at the these results in relation to teacher professional no, powerful knowledge in this digital classroom, uh, our our ah, finding through. I can't move. So I have to. So yeah, um, we would like to say that. Um, in relation to transformation processes, the observed uh, transformation processes of the subject content are merely reproductive, which offer the students limited opportunities for lit literacy engagement. And we can also uh, conclude that the teacher's literacy engagement with the digital texts is richer than that of the students which points at a challenge for teachers to, to develop practices uh, of higher epistemic quality. Uh, so the digital devices and the, di the, the digitalized classroom offer the teacher a lot of agency to produce teaching material and to produce uh, something uh, that, that could be uh, of, of um, that, that, that the students could uh, benefit from, but uh, in this situation, it um, strengthens the the agency and the um, um, the power of the teacher, but not of the learners. And uh, because they they, they um, the digital devices offer the teacher a possibility to be creative and also have full control over the enacted cur curriculum, which leaves the students with as being listeners and just reproductive of the uh, reproducing the material and, and the text that, that the, the teacher offers during this um, lesson. And to um, try to say something about uh, the um, uh, figure that, that uh, Brian presented in the last presentation, we could say that um, what the digital devices do, uh, at least in this example, and we have a numerous of other examples, uh, which have, I haven't 
talked about here, but uh, we have written about them, them in, in other contexts, is that the, um, the challenges uh, when you put in digital technologies and when you did digitalize the classroom, the challenges is not the content, uh, what, what content, why and how. It's merely the teacher design. How, how should the teacher use the technologies uh, and put them into play in the technology? Uh, and what kind of te technologies should be used for why and, and uh, why should they be used and how and also for whom? Uh, so, so what uh, um, Brian talked about, about teachers as designers, uh, I would say is the big challenge uh, when, when we have this high uh, a digitalized uh, classroom and teaching practices today. So, and that was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, so um, that brings us to um, the final stage of this panel discussion. And we'd really welcome uh, questions. Uh, we'd welcome uh, I, you posting them in the chat or simply raising your hand and uh, we can take a question or um, also um, any observations that you might have. So you might have a reaction that you want to, you want to make more of a comment um, and that will be most welcome. So would anybody like to start? Anybody have a question? I, I, I'll raise a question for us in, whilst, whilst other people are trying to formulate them. Um, for, for all of us, really, for, for all the panel, and actually for the audience, um, what, what might be the implications for teacher education policy and practice as a result of um, thinking about this panel discussion? Anybody like to? kick off on um, a response to that question. So what might be the implications if, if for example, you were meeting with um, a government minister or a regional development advisor for your community, um, what would be the implications? What would, you, what would you say to them in a nutshell that might um, address some of the challenges or help to support teachers in addressing some of the challenges which have been put into sharp relief, relief really through the pandemic. Any thoughts? Should I? I can start. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think it's uh, one thing that that strikes me when I when I uh, uh, think back to the research we've done before and the uh, the research our, our colleagues have done is in relation to the the structure of the teacher education is and then I compare how the teacher education is organized in Sweden uh, and elsewhere I guess uh, I think there is a great need to be. Uh, to, to try to, in a better way, integrate the, 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 the theory and practice, because that is a common theme within the different chapters that we have discussed, because otherwise we can't, I mean, the question that Christina, the issue that you saw that about the teacher that is so focused on the technology that, that hinders him from actually go into the didactic perspective in the way that uh, enables the students to, to actually learn what 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 they <laughs> should learn in a way. Uh, I think that that is the way. If if you are possible, there are a greater possibility to, uh, to to integrate the aspect of practice in in uh, in the teacher education. I, I think that is a, a, a main aspect, and and not letting go with the theoretical, because in England, I guess, the, th the trend is that you relocate the, the teacher education and um, 
you get rid of the university out of the teacher education and all is practice but the thing is that you you need both both um, uh, both theory and practice and I, I, I if I met the 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 uh, Anna Ekström in, in, in Sweden, I, I think that a, a reorganization of the teacher education in Sweden, bringing uh, in, in really bringing theory and practice together should be a, a priority in, in, in what she should be doing uh, mm -hmm. the next year or so. Okay, I just, just to respond to that, uh, um, Michael Apple last night really described quite powerfully the competing forces um, at a, an international level in terms of uh, approaches to education. And um, you, you could see them being played out quite vividly in the United States. And, and you, can, you can see those forces, I think, um, within each, each of the European countries that we're part of. Um, I think what, what we've got in England actually is, is a, what's happened over the last few years with more emphasis on schools is that we've had greatly strengthened partnerships between higher education and schools. And um, I think it's it's the um, there there are forces now that would like to move much more to a um, a model which might be more closely uh, related to that instructional design model that I was referring to of of of. Uh, the, the curriculum being determined by others and implemented through scripted curriculum and scripted lessons um, by teachers as technicians. And I think I think it's that it's that it's that tension between the teacher as professional or um, powerful knowledge professional or teacher as technician that's um, that's in play. And it's it's that struggle, I think, that's that's apparent more so in some countries than others at the moment. But but is being played out across different contexts um, at an international level. Further comments, um, Nicholas? Would you like to comment? Oh, oh, sorry, Christina, I didn't see your hand then. Yeah, please. It's all right. I, I I could just uh, I could just add on that because we had a really uh, uh, interesting seminar with with the Czech Vista uh, at, at our university. Uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, where he was promoting uh, the idea of, of teaching as art, uh, um, that you have to leave some, uh, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't really uh, um, in advance decide all aspects of the teaching uh, process during the lesson or, or, or yeah. during uh, the learning process. Uh, and, and you have to you be, have to be very um, uh, flexible and uh, um, open for for new tra trajectories during uh, during the, the teaching situation, and and that is part of 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 uh, of teaching as art. <laughs> mm. uh, so so this idea of um, of um, uh, having a script or or um, a bunch of, of ready. Um, prepared lessons, which any anyone could could uh, uh, teach. It is, it's, that is taking away the essence of of yeah. of of uh, the, um, um, the of being a teacher. Uh, yeah. And we, we could we could see that uh, in in material where we have interviewed teachers during the pandemic now. But that was exactly what was happening. Uh, when, when in this crisis situation, that they wanted to have um, um, uh, the, 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 head, the rectors and the headmasters, they wanted to have a library of ready prepared lessons for anyone to, to uh, conduct because of, of uh, uh, they didn't know if, if teachers were going to be sick or, or on leave or, or whatever uh, but i think that is a very very risky way to go mm. so and and that is something that teacher education should uh, um, at least more in sweden think of um, that you have to have this art dimension of yes. what the teaching yeah. is thank you christina um i'll go to nicholas and then martin yeah nicholas 
I, I just uh, agree with the discussion here, and and I would. Uh, I, I think this idea of uh, uh, having control. I mean, you said the, the the struggle internationally, and and also often in the agenda. It's kind of defining a problem in society and then solve it in school, <clears throat> and then someone else have an idea of how that should be solved. Either somewhere else, not the teacher. So, uh, I, and I think very much in the, especially the second book here from which Martin talked about the, the importance of identifying the professional knowledge and, and the kind of, uh, I think that is very important uh, part of teacher education to reinforce the professional knowledge and the independence of the teacher. Mm. So the teacher not become the script reader, uh, <clears throat> but that is problematic, uh, especially I think in Sweden, because the, the discourse in society is often uh, when some problem emerged, it's okay, let's solve this problem like the teacher doesn't exist, that by we doing some kind of decision making. And, and uh, but uh, it's the teacher that always should kind of uh, <laughs> solve the problem in the classroom. But the, the problem addressed is not the problem the teacher identifies. So it's someone else identifying the problem and giving the assignment to the teacher to solve the problem. So I think uh, that the, the loss of this uh, professional uh, recognition of the teacher is, is a problem, at least in Sweden and as in our discussion also in, in, uh, in, in, in UK. But per, perhaps now we don't have any from Finland here, but uh, when our talks uh, with the Finnish colleagues, still perhaps they have a little bit more of the professional independence in some countries. And I think that is something to strive for in, in teacher education, mm -hmm. to, to uh, reassure this kind of professional independence of the teacher to recognize the problem and also recognize the, the, the teaching. So, so, yeah, the script is, uh, is a dangerous way, I think, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Martin? Yeah, but, 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 but I think, uh, uh, just a reflection, uh, I, I met last autumn, I had a, a group of teacher students and we had this discussion. I said, you have to focus on the building aspect. You never know what's happening in class. You have this agency and, and the student says, I don't, I don't want an agency. I want to know how to do it. So they wanted a toolbox. So the discourse is very, so strong that you, as a teacher educator, you have to, you really have to, um, to work uh, to, to break it in a way. And we had a similar, uh, last week we had a conference within the history education in Sweden. And, uh, and it's quite obvious that the discourse within our, my field of history education has changed because there is much more focus on measure, measurement than it used to be for like 10 or 15 years ago. And then we had these discussions that now we are part of the, the discourse uh, you, uh, because we had had the discussion on how to specify uh, the syllabi. And we said, oh, there is a risk if we mention everything that the students should read at in secondary school uh, just because it's easy to, to measure what happens about the, the knowledge production about the building perspective. So this discourse is so is so so strong that we get caught it in ourselves in a way, and it's very strong within the, the studious, uh, teacher students. Just a just a reflection. Thank you for that. I mean, I I, I was reflecting um, on the aspect of building as as something um, quite specific and, and particular about the tradition of didactics, which is. Um, which is something that maybe maybe you know we, we need to think about more and think about how that's that's addressed and communicated. Um, it's because it's it's far more than the content, isn't it? We we talk about content, but the content has been a means through which the uh, the students themselves, as you know, the, the kids in the class, can achieve that um, that sort of state of building in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Any further observations?
Uh, Christina, you've still got your hand up. Was that yeah, intended? No, no, I, yeah, do, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add on that because I, I, I think really that uh, we, we are a number of persons that would advocate the building aspect uh, in, in many cases. Uh, but I think we, we, we can't win that battle unless we, we um, not take away, but at least diminish the pressure on teachers and teacher educators of, of being mm. uh, in this measurement swamp, <laughs> if you can yeah. say that. Yes. I mean, yes. Yes. Because yes. that is, if, if you have, if, as long as you have that one, you can't, mm. uh, you can't reach teachers with, with the building aspect because that mm. it's, it doesn't fit within the, the measurement um, paradigm. Mm. So I think we the, have to start uh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the other dimension that um, uh, I'm reflecting on as we, as we speak, I mean, I, I, I asked the question about implications for policy. Um, what, one of the things that's come through strongly for me over the last couple of days is um, the way in which parents have expressed a much greater appreciation of the work of teachers and their, their role in terms of um, not simply teaching content, but you know, looking after the well-being and social development of, uh, of children in classrooms. Um, and it feels to me that um, there's a job for us as teacher educators, as educators, as teachers, to um, seek to build alliances with, with parents in terms of thinking about uh, what future do they want for their public education system? Do they want this remote education um, based on scripted lessons and scripted curricula by technicians? Or do they want to see professionally trained teachers uh, who have powerful knowledge and skills and uh, dispositions um, teaching teaching their children? And, and um, so may, maybe we, we need to look beyond the direct sort of um, line between ourselves and policymakers and build alliances with local communities and, and parents groups and um, you know ask them what they want in terms of their public education system. That's, that's a great idea actually. <laughs> that's really nice. Any further observations? It's been a fascinating discussion um, and I hope uh, those attending have um, found it um, informative and helpful. And as I said earlier, we've got references both in the presentations, which will be available after the conference, and also in the abstract, which is on the web, um, embedded in the um, programme. So if we don't have any further questions, uh, I'd like to thank our host, Jakob, for organising this so efficiently. And Thank my co-presenters for a really stimulating and interesting discussion, as always. And uh, thank you to those who have attended. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.